speakers uh, would like to respond to any of the respondent uh, comments, or we can go on. I'll, I'll uh, say please. one thing about, is this working? No. Is it working now? Okay. I guess I'll say something about one trial learning. One trial learning. Um, I guess one thing is I don't really believe it. Um, the other thing is, you know, the, the diminishing returns graph that I showed, often short term you see what you think is learning, but actually quicker learning, it's been shown in the metacognitive literature, quicker learning leads to quicker decay. So if the goal is long term learning, one trial learning is not really something to depend on. Right, it, you should more depend on slow, Question. effortful, mistakeful learning. That's right. Painful learning. Painful learning. <laughs> they, they call slow, it desirable effortful. difficulty. Yes, yes. Um, we, we are a little close on time, so if there are no other comments immediately, I'm happy to go to questions. And uh, Pam Smith has one from there. No, we're recording it. Um, I, I wonder if it's useful to um, examine that assumption, but that's not my main question. Um, my main question is for the confidence building and the um, time to iteration, et cetera, was there any, uh, did you um, measure or test were all the students the same? I mean, did you test for gender or did you um, uh, record for gender? Did you record for um, background, anything like that? Um, so we did it in that particular study. We were basically focused on the incremental versus the entity uh, questionnaire. Um, so it was really about what people think about how intelligence can change or not. So that was what we had focused on. And there are probably a lot of differences in terms of learning styles and also learning curves. For everyone, learning curves will be different. Um, there's no such thing as that beautiful little S-shaped curve. In fact, I think Kathy's curve was the right one, right? That went up and down. So it's really in the, in the kind of the valleys where the learning is actually occurring, but the out to the outsider, we're looking at the peaks and thinking that that's where the learning's occurring and it's actually not true. Lisa, I'm sorry. I, I have to admit that I don't know the difference between incremental and Oh, I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, so incremental theorists are, are people who believe that intelligence can change with environment, with inspiration, motivation, and study time, right? And entity theorists are those people who believe that it's a really fixed quantity that you have of intelligence. You're born with it in a certain way. And in the past, it, historically, if you take a look at Americans versus certain other cultures, Americans have been largely found to be entity theorists. Um, and, and people have talked about it in many different ways. It's, it's a huge subfield, um, starting with Carol Dweck. But really, when you, when you think about how we speak to kids, how we speak to kids, when we, talk, when we use trait language, like, oh, you're so smart, you're so brilliant, those words are giving them the impression that they were born that way and it cannot be changed. And that's a real issue with how we're, we're, we're speaking to our kids, right? Great. Question, yes. Hi, uh, Cornell Green, uh, failureguy.com. Um, fascinating uh, uh, hearing about these studies in, in an academic uh, context, but as my concern tends to be uh, socioeconomic and, and dealing with adults and specifically entrepreneurs and small business owners, was there any, uh, uh, research into the emotional uh, effect of this, uh, particularly in the, in the studies of the illusory uh, failure, um, getting the students to overcome the aspects of, of confronting failure that were emotional, you know, the, 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 the shame or embarrassment or things of that nature. I'm sure that there are a lot, and I don't know all of it, but Carol Dweck has, has had a lot of, has done a lot of work on this, and one thing that I do remember her saying um, in one of her papers and giving a lot of talks on this is she looked at clinical depression. Hmm. And th when you look at people and who, what, what, what kind of learning intelligence theories lead to depression the most, hmm. 
it's, it, they're the people who are, first of all, entity theorists, and second of all, have performance goals rather than learning goals. Mm. So obviously, we all fail at one time or another, right? So if you're an entity theorist with a performance goal and you fail the test, there's nothing you can do about it. It can lead to some kind of emotional depression. Mm. But if you are an incremental theorist, no matter what, if you fail, you say, oh, well, I need to have studied differently, right? So, so in that sense, the emotional, it's, it's a, has a really devastating hmm. consequence. Okay, right? okay. I, I could see where that'd be kind of troublesome since obviously uh, economics and, and business tends to be quite performance <laughs> oriented. Definitely. Where, yeah. where, you know, the learning curve is if you fail, you, you go out of business. So, yeah. uh, and that's the problem. The real problem is, it's interesting because I said before with different cultures, in, in East Asian cultures, they're thought to be very much incremental theorists. It's all about hard work. Mm. The problem is you see a lot of depression and suicide there oh. because the performance goal is just canceling all that out. Right. Right, it's mm -hmm. all about the performance. And so one of the things that I like to do is try to think about in, in the East Asian communities, we need to get back to learning goals. Mm. They already are incremental, Okay. right? So okay. it's, they're two different problems. It'd be fascinating to see how to bring a little of that into Western culture. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. A question for John Black and Lisa Song. Um, Dr. Black talked a lot about um, what was effective and how students weren't using what was effective. And Dr. Song talked about getting students to sort of use the harder strategies. But I also know from the desirable li difficulty literature that, um, that um, just reading something and studying it repeatedly isn't always the most effective strategy. Do you think that Dr. Song's intervention could be used to get students to study not only longer, but also more effectively? I think that was directed to you, but does yeah, it have so to be? Or, or well, Kathy. the, the or strategy Kathy. I was trying to get the students to use was, in fact, the most difficult one. Mm -hmm. and they didn't want to do it because it was going to take more effort and so forth. So, you know, what I'm pondering is, well, what's, what would convince them that it's worth the effort, you know, mm -hmm. to do that? And, what if you just remove the easy ones? Huh? <laughs> what if you didn't give them the easy ones? <laughs> well, we taught them, you know, you're supposed to use this, you know, mm -hmm. and they didn't. <laughs> they did the other stuff anyhow. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, and like I say, this is something I've observed in a number of different studies, so uh, that's a kind of a problem. So, yeah, so that if they use that, that would be the desirable difficulty and it would do it. So uh, somehow you have to, to get them convinced that it's, it's worth the effort to do that. Yeah, and yeah. I agree with that. And I, I have um, I have some newer data that isn't yet published. It's under review right now, where we simply we did just did the forcing strategy. We gave uh, we had two different conditions of just simple trivia questions. Half the students got very difficult trivia questions. The other half got very easy trivia questions. And then we simply asked them, okay, you have to do the sixth question now. Do you want the easy one or the hard one? In the first block, everyone chose the same. There was no difference between the groups. They chose the kind of easier ones. But we did four blocks, and in the next three blocks, all of a sudden you see a difference in what they chose. And the people who got originally the first five difficult ones, they started choosing the more difficult ones. So it's just the experience of being okay with working hard. Interesting, thank you. I, I, there's a, um Somebody in, in the room, I'm sure will know his name, is a statistician at, I think, Cambridge, University of Cambridge in England, David Steighalter, I don't remember his last name. It's a tricky last name, but he's designed tests which are almost like what you do in a way, in which the student not only gets to answer the question, but then also makes a judgment as to how right, how likely they think that answer is correct. And they're, if they answer wrongly, but with 100% surety, they're heavily penalized. Whereas if they answer correctly but with a low surety, they don't get much reward. And so the, the trick just, is to just, balance these, I'm right? I'm sorry, I'm taking up so much time. No. Um, but but this, I think this is very important because um, this is just a kind of caveat. Uh, a few years ago, I think it's been like eight or nine years ago now, what I did was something similar to that where I had people on their biology exams at college, at Columbia and Barnard, um, do the multiple choice questions, but for each question, give a confidence judgment. Mm -hmm. And that the hope was to be get them more aware, more self-reflective, and then have higher performance. Half the people did these confidence questions, half the people didn't. The problem we found was we saw 
ethnic differences. And this, this is related to stereotype threat, I think. We, 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 we did it twice because we thought, oh, this is a fluke. It, we got the same exact thing on the second midterm where white students, when they're asked to make confidence judgments and to reflect and to really think about their performance, they did better. When we looked at the black and the Hispanic students, asked them to reflect about their performance, well, they, did they did worse. Yeah, because they self. Uh, so, so, so this is a, we think it's a sort of stereotype threat mm -hmm. procedure that's occurring that we didn't know about. We thought metacognition in this way would help everybody. Um, and so we had to stop that, uh, that test. That's interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah one, the condition, one condition in my second study that I didn't talk about was what I call a global awareness there. And that was one of these confidence kind of judgments things too. Like you had a question where it said, okay, and after you've made this error here, how, how well do you think you know this topic? You know, had them sort of reflect on that. Just doing that kind of manipulation about the confidence didn't in fact increase their learning later. They had to do this more effective strategy. Yes. Uh, with respect to the development of language in very young children, um, I've noticed just casually that in some homes, parents speak in complete sentences to even the most youngest of their children, while others talk in a more uh, childlike fashion uh, to their very, very young children. Is there any evidence to show that one approach or the other uh, has a positive effect on uh, learning and the development of language skills? So I can't answer your question directly, but for sure there are very large impacts on many aspects of language, particularly vocabulary, of the amount of speech that kids from different social class and economic backgrounds encounter. So one estimate is that there's a 30,000 word gap in the number of words that kids just hear uh, over dinnertime conversation, over casual comments during the course of the day. And these turn out not only to have immediate effects, but very long-term effects, so that the amount of conversation, just the number of unique words that kids hear, and uniqueness of words is correlated with complete sentences, I think. And that turns out to be predictive of vocabulary at age 11 and presumably beyond. They just tested it at age 11. So I, I suspect it does have an effect, but I don't know if there's any research that directly addresses your question. Okay. Uh, did you say a 30,000 word? That's like half the language, isn't it? No, no, no that, that it's, uh, there's a type token distinction. So see, okay. it isn't 30,000 unique words. I see, okay, okay. I couldn't <laughs> imagine. <laughs> I think I know that many words. If I may, if I may ask a follow-up to that question, then, um, if a child then is, spends most of their very young years at home surrounded by perhaps two or three adults and not necessarily spoken to, but hears in the background a certain amount of vocabulary and, uh, and discussion going on versus children who are put in daycare at a very early age, and probably hear a lot more language around them during the day, although not perhaps being spoken to directly. <coughs> is there any uh, benefit associated with that? So there, there actually is research that I know about. And the answer is either little impact, though positive, or no impact. Depends on the particular study. But it, it does, certainly doesn't do their vocabulary any harm, and it may do the, it, them a little good. There, there's also other work suggesting that students learn language best when they have someone interacting with them, right, as opposed to just hearing in the background. So students, for example, learn language better when they're interacting with a live person than watching someone talking on a television screen, for okay, example. Okay, so one-on-one -on -one interaction is yeah. the best. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, hi, I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Siegler something. You had a slide up, uh, or whatever you're calling these things, these days, uh, which said one of the things you can do uh, when you're trying to get to a goal is change it to another goal entirely. And when you said that, uh, a light bulb went off for me because uh, one of the things that 
I once came up with was a name for that, and maybe it needs a, a unique word uh, to explain it, and I had that word was sidention, just uh, to let you know. You um, it with a P-S-Y or a... Well, you know, that's interesting <laughs> because uh, actually by the next day I, I came up with uh, three other spellings for the same pronunciation. <laughs> but this is S-I-D-E-N-T-I-O-N. And uh, uh, for Dr. Song, next to you, um, when, when you were showing your things on the screen, um, and especially the WTF uh, cartoon, uh, I was also thinking that uh, uh, from movies uh, uh, I've seen, and, and it might be good to illustrate uh, the explanation with clips from movies, uh, especially when you see uh, uh, soldiers in boot camp and the drill instructor is saying, do you think you're going to you know, pass this, uh, you know, be here in one, one week from now? I don't think so, you know, and that's uh, a stopping them before. And I'm, I'm a very movie-oriented person, and I, I think, you know, this whole uh, explanation for adults uh, with movie clips would, would be kind of interesting because it, it's the, the proof of concept in real life. Thank you. Hi, Hi my name's Myung Lee, and uh, I have like <laughs> lots of questions, but I try to be really <laughs> quick. <laughs> and my question, I'm not in academia, I'm not a teacher or whatever, so I have this freedom to speak my mind, which is wonderful, so I will just <laughs> do that. And then what uh, struck me uh, throughout the conference yesterday and today it feels like to me that we still value success over failure. And then we are actually, some failures are better than others. Because I hear a lot of words like productive failure and how to use failure as a stepping stone towards success kind. And I guess as a person who failed to uh, get my PhD <laughs> and, and failed multiple times, it kind of, and I'm a very competitive person. So I have this enormous pressure to succeed, which didn't help. And I have this fear of failure, because, uh, a huge fear of failure. I'm not at the moment, but then 20 years ago. And so how that, it kind of like uh, what Dr. Son mentioned about this like entity and incrementer theories, and then how that individual difference plays a part. And then I'm just curious how like, like the anxiety or like, you know, all these other individual different factors plays in the research of the psychology of failure. Um, and I think, you know, all of the research that I heard today is about cognitive task. And for me, it feels like that uh, failure is almost like in our head. It's an interpretation of an event. It's not really reality. And it's all how we see failure. What if we don't see failure as failure? I mean, like, I'm a huge baseball fan. So, and I learned from baseball was uh, all these wonderful, like, uh, MLB players, they fail seven out of 10 times, and we celebrate them, right? Also, but then, we pay yeah. Them. We yeah. pay them a lot. Yeah. Oh, yeah, true. Yeah. <laughs> but then I, I wish I knew that. Because I didn't know. I wanted to succeed 10 out of 10 times. And even when I failed in one part of my life, I wanted to compensate that fa failure by succeeding in other, other part of my life. So let's say that uh, I won, like it's a lot of, I, I don't know anybody so I can speak, right? <laughs> so, so when I was failing, failing, when I, I wanted to succeed in failing my marriage. And how like, weird it is, it created enormous anxiety. And it, it was only when I actually accepted, okay, it's the same. Not one is better than another. That's what, when it empowered me to actually move forward and just be myself. 
So I guess ever since I quit grad school, I became quite the hippie. So, so I'm just curious, why do we still value success over failure? And then why do I hear a lot of these value-laden words in failure research because I was more expecting celebrating failure, but then all I, I mean, a lot of not, you know, I'm not in any position to criticize any of you, so uh, it's just my curiosity that, okay, well, yeah. Does anybody want to so, respond to this? So first of all, good friend, myung -ni, you're you're definitely not a failure. Um, <laughs> and in fact, if you're a failure, we're all failures, right? So the one thing is, you know, we're, we're fellow Koreans. And again, like I said before, there's, a, there's a, an incredible performance-oriented goals for certain groups of people, and also in America more and more, especially when you think about testing, teaching to the test, everything's about the test. And when you talk about things like marriage, learning a language, baseball, these very general, very big term uh, kinds of um, ambitions, Right. If if the the problem is is that we're still focusing on the performance, on the evaluation, and that's our problem. That but that doesn't necessarily have to be called a failure. Right. Again, if we were focusing on the learning process, right. Whatever each of us is going through in our lives, the learning process. It's 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 not failures. They're really little failures that are actually successes. Right. And so I think it's I think. Um, you know, we, we all have these big failures, and, and it does lead to anxiety, but I think a lot of it has to do with we're trying to show to others that we've achieved this kind of in the conventional performance way, which isn't, isn't the right goal, right? Because you were still saying that right, there is right and wrong. No, so, I'm saying, so for example, I'm saying that you don't have to be married. You don't have to, you know, be a certain. I'm saying. So I'm saying that but if then it's the, the learning society focus, romanticizes, and then they, there are yeah, these like media ideals. True. It's definitely true, yeah. and it's the same thing in education. Yeah, anyway, right. The yeah. schools is we right. All right. I'm sorry to say it's the right time for a break. So we, if, I don't know if it's the right time, but we have to take a break. So, um, so we're going to take a break for 15 minutes, I believe it is. Is that right? 15 minutes, and then we'll come back for the next session. Thank you. Thank you very much to everybody. Very cool.